Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be presenting here at the uh, Stem Cell and Mason meeting for the first time. We're all happy at my medics to be here presenting. Um, and I hopefully by the end of this talk, you will understand why we are presenting here. We are a public company, so please be aware of our um, um, forward-looking statement here. I want to uh, briefly give you some introductory remarks on the company. Um, this chart shows revenues, uh, consistent and sustainable growth over the past three years. Um, we are, again, like I say, a, a public company. We trade at NASDAQ um, under the MDXG. Um, the um, um, thing to remember here is that, or the thing that I want to point out here with this chart is that we are predicting in 2014 revenue of about $115 million. That's um, a sustainable, consistent growth over the 2011 number, which was about $7 million. We are also anticipating reporting our first operating uh, profit operating quarter for the third quarter of this year. So MyMedics is a mission and technology. Um, is MyMedics is a regenerative medicine company. We deliver innovative technologies that enable healing. <clears throat> Our objective is to provide regenerative science-based solutions for physicians to meet the need of patients. So I'm going to uh, now get into um, our scientific data and the science of dehydrated or dehackum, dehydrated human amnion chorion. So we uh, procure donated placenta from um, donors that are undergoing scheduled cesarean sections. We take those, the placenta, we take the amniotic membrane, dissect it, and then um, cleanse it to remove residual blood and also any associated maternal elements that might be remaining with the tissue. Um, we use a uh, proprietary purion process um, and the resulting product is a bilayer laminate composed of both amnion and chorion. I want to point out here that this is, I will relate to you in just a minute with respect to the um, characteristics of the product is that um, not all dried products are the same. They're not all equal. So any comparisons made with respect to a dried product are not valid unless that dried product has been purion processed. And the reason I bring that up is because what I'm going to show you today is the biological activities um, associated with this material, with this product. So the product, um, the cells are preserved in the product. Um, this is not an acellular product nor a decellularized product. Um, the cells um, are remaining. You can see in the H&E on the right side, you can sell, see cell nuclei. Um, the cells are structurally intact and they are bioactive. I don't mean that these cells are viable when I say bioactive. What I mean is that they retain bioactive factors both within the cell and the cell membrane as well as probably more importantly in the pericellular space. Um, the purion process also preserves the extracellular matrix, in particular here, collagens 1, 3, 4, 5, and 7, laminin, fibronectin, and proteoglycans. Um, uh, very importantly, this, this um, purion process retains the biologically active um, growth factors, cytokines, and chemokines, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the, the evidence for that statement. So we have um, identified at least 57. Um, preserved growth factors and cytokines. These include regulators of wound healing and regulators of inflammation. Epifix and Amniofix are our two bilayer laminate products. What um, the, the important thing is that the, that the prion process actually preserves these in the material. It doesn't mean that they're act this doesn't mean they're active, but it means they're preserved in the material. So um, we have actually identified more than this. This is what we published. I also want to point out I'm not going to be showing you much data today, um, but on all of the slides that contain um, conclusions, I have cited the published literature, we have published in the peer-reviewed literature. So the regulators of inflammation, as I pointed out, there are both chemokines, and chemokines are known to recruit cells of the inflammatory and the immune system. So um, I should point out first that in that middle graph, um, chronic wounds are, remain chronic because they have elevated and consistent, repeatable, continued um, inflammation. 
in order to in order to get the wound to move out of that phase, you have to control the inflammation first. So there are chemokines in our in the um, DHACM which recruit cells of the inflammatory immune system, and there are regulator cytokines that regulate the activity of those cells. The, this is known pure, and you can look in the biological literature. Um, we've heard a lot about lifestyle therapies, uh, therapies, and I just want to make a couple comments. I think many of you recognize this has been a consistent problem, um, is that there are two significant interrelated challenges, engraftment of applied stem cells and low survival of cells um, at the site of application. Um, this is particularly true in wound healing. The solution, or the potential solution, is d -hackum graft facilitates engraftment and survival of stem cells, and I'm going to show you the data for that. So this is a really um, great study done by Dr. Gertner in the Department of Plastic Surgery at um, Stanford Medical School. It's called a parabiosis experiment where you, in fact, join two mice. One has um, been genetically modified to contain green fluorescent protein bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. It is parabiosed to a normal mouse. You put in the um, products of interest, in this case, Epifix, Sham, and a control ADM, which is TEI prime matrix, which is basically a decellularized collagen scaffold. You look then over time for the presence of green cells associated with the implants or the sham. And if green cells appear um, in the implant, around the implant, in, in the, then you know that the material is, is recruiting stem cells from the green mouse. And the data here on the right is um, in this paper, um, which has just come out in the Journal of Surgical Research from the Gertner Lab. Um, and you can see from these data that, in fact, um, Epifix recruits um, these uh, bone marrow, green fluorescent protein labeled green, marrow, uh, green mouse bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. I should also say in this model that um, we have also looked at a number of other stem cells. I'm not going to get into that. I'd refer you to the Journal of Surgical Research paper um, to look at that. Um, so DHACM, um, we have coined the term stem cell magnet because we have shown both in vitro and in vivo that um, um, recruiting factors leave a wound site and they will recruit bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells to the site of the wound. We also have data which shows that in fact the material will also cause MSCs to proliferate. The HACM also has angiogenic properties. This is a list of known angiogenic growth factors. All of these are in fact promote um, and stimulate angiogenesis. This was published in the paper that you uh, cited there. <clears throat> what we have found with this, with this material is that, in fact, induces endothelial cell migration. These are human, human microvascular endothelial cells in vitro. Causes endothelial cells to proliferate. And, and interestingly enough, upregulates biosynthesis of angiogenic factors by endothelial cells, which means that this is an amplification effect. It is actually telling the resident cells to um, upregulate up production of more angiogenic factors. So the d and regenerative therapy um, is a, a uh, summary slide. I haven't shown you all this data, but it causes a potent mitogen, causes dermal fibroblasts, microvascular endothelial cells, mesenchymal stem cells to proliferate. There's a recruiting causing uh, migration of dermal fibroblasts, endothelial cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and it's a stem cell magnet for the three cell types noted. I will point out that we've got a lot of data on hematopoietic stem cells, and I would refer you to the couple papers that um, I cited earlier. So in the last um, few minutes, I just want to go over some uh, results of clinical trials, um, which shows the uh, clinical efficacy. So this is a diabetic foot ulcer, chronic foot ulcer, randomized clinical trial um, showing you the outcomes. And the point of this is that um, you can see with epifix treatment, this is the standard of care on the upper graph on the right, and um, the um, epifix treatment on the bottom right. And you can see that over the eight-week period, we had a 92% healing rate, 92%. This is a DFU retrospective crossover study. These are the same patients, but it are the patients that did not heal during the study. They were in the control group. They did not heal. They were allowed to choose whether they wanted to, in fact, um, get the Epifix treatment. Um, and um, I think 12 of them did, in fact. And you can see that in the retro, retro crossover on the right, those patients healed. Um, so we have also looked at um, whether one or two treatments with Epifix um, you know, makes a difference with respect to healing. And in fact, you can see from this chart that yes, it does make a difference. It's the speed of healing. 
not necessarily the um, extent of healing. We still have um, a significant amount of healing in these patients. Um, um, as listed there, 92.5% healed within the 12 week study period. The mean time to healing was four weeks for bi weekly and 2.4 weeks for the weekly application. Um, and the number of grafts needed to heal um, was the same in both cases, um, around 2.3 to 2.4 grafts. I'd like to finish, um, no, I'm sorry, this is, so this is a long term follow up. Um, of these um, same patients with respect to the ones that had healed. One of the key things about healing a chronic wound is it does not reoccur. And, there, and this happens quite often, that you can heal it up initially, but then in fact it, it will open up again. Um, so this was a long-term follow-up of the um, patients that were in the initial DFU study. So this is a nine to 12 month follow-up. We had 18 of the 22 eligible patients returned for follow-up, and 5.6% did not. Uh, or in fact had recurrent DFUs following the period, but it's 94% of the patients remain fully healed. This is quite an effective treatment to, re to keep a chronic wound healed. The last study is a study we just published, just came out, which is a multi-center randomized controlled venous leg ulcer trial with 84 patients, 53 in the treated arm and uh, 31 in the control arm. And in fact, for this, we did um, either weekly treatments or, or um, biweekly treatments, and you can see that the, the and this is a surrogate, we've chosen a surrogate um, endpoint, which is four weeks. Obviously, these, these patients haven't healed in four weeks, but it's a good surrogate endpoint to predict whether these patients will, in fact, heal. And this study is still ongoing. Um, but you can see that the mean percent reduction in wound size for both one and two treatments um, with the Epifix was significantly different um, than the control that, was, that re received the um, standard uh, compression therapy. So in, in summary, DHACM regenerative therapy, scientifically proven and clinically effective. Thank you.